This debt, this destruction. Global news impacts us. We have to change the way we live. This is why we need independent media. Hello, one and all. Cheers and salutations. Good morning. We have a very special interview here for Hard Lens Media. Uh, for those of you who have been watching our programming since 2017, uh, some time ago in uh, late 2018, early 2019, my colleague and I, Daniel Upker, uh, did a documentary video called The Toxic Tour. And sometime in October of 2022, we did a second follow-up. Uh, to the, to what I feel is a story that's gone underreported, especially when it comes down to the safety of the communities and cities that surround Lake Michigan. For those who don't know, Lake Michigan is a large body of fresh uh, water. And uh, let's face it, without water, um, <laughs> a lot of things fall apart. Um, but unfortunately, in our time of covering uh, the heavy industrial facilities that are polluting the air, water, and soil, especially in Indiana, which has a laissez-faire approach in regards towards regulation and being very pro-corporate to the industries that are there. Uh, communities are now severely impacted with health issues, as well as the fact that the environments uh, are heavily polluted, causing a great disturbance to the ecosystems and so much more. Um, and recently, there was a video that has been shared by an individual that we had on the show in the past. His name is Thomas Frank. Thomas, thank you so much for joining our show. It's been some time. I remember you have you being on our radio show and a few of our other programs back in the day. Uh, for our viewers and subscribers, can you please reintroduce yourself and tell our viewing audience who you are and the work that you've done in regards towards Shining a light on what I feel is, again, an underreported story of the heavy industrial pollution that's happening in Indiana. Well, my name is Thomas Frank. I am a, oh, geez, an artist, an organizer. Uh, I was a person in urban planning, studied urban planning, and was conducting a comprehensive plan for the city of East Chicago, uh, which kind of considers itself to be the most industrial uh, city on the planet. And pr it pretty much is. Uh, we have the largest Tar Sands Refinery with BP here in East Chicago, which is known as the Whiting, the BP Whiting Refinery. And we also have the largest integrated steel mill in the Western Hemisphere with Cleveland Cliffs uh, right here. So uh, I have been active first on the government side uh, years and years ago until BP announced its mega project to retool its refinery to be the largest private investment in Indiana's history. Uh, to receive the tar sands from northern Alberta. And I kind of became a whistleblower and was immediately fired, et cetera, et cetera, and found myself organizing uh, against the facility and the things that were going on there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, since then, um, obviously, uh, this is an article that just only came out earlier of this year in January. I want to pull it up for our viewing audience so they can see it as well. Um, it's talking about BP, especially the one in Indiana, a new study. And this again, this article came out in January of 2023. A new study of more than 80 refineries raised serious questions, uh, raised serious concerns about the wastewater they are pumping into lakes and rivers across the United States. One of those polluters is BP Whiting Refinery in northwest Indiana. Uh, according to a report released today uh, called Oil's Unchecked Outfalls, uh, more than half a billion gallons of polluted laden waters are released from the refineries each day. The wastewater includes toxic chemicals, metals, including arsenic, cyanide, chromium, and more. So let's just um, look at this from the perspective of somebody who lives in Chicago, for example, or maybe in Wisconsin. Why should they care that waste is being polluted uh, like this this industrial waste is being put into lake michigan they say well it'll just dissipate away dilution is a solution just put it in water and it'll go away can you can you elaborate uh on the whole idea of uh dilution is a solution i yeah. i don't mean i don't mean to upset you with that because we talked about it before but i think people you need to know why that's a bad idea yeah um well uh, dilution is the solution used to be the moniker of the EPA for the first like 25, 30 years. We're now more than 50 years into the EPA. Um, at least in Illinois, what happens is the authorities EPA is given over to the states and uh, different states uh, apply those rules rigorously or re in a relaxed fashion. Indiana likes to apply them in a very relaxed fashion. Uh, 
our environmental regime is pro-corporate and dilution is the solution is basically thinking that the the fresh the greatest freshwater resource on the planet that being the great lakes is mm -hmm. so large that you can pump any amount of toxic things in there and it would uh, dilute be diluted by the fresh waters and you would never see uh, much an effect uh, much effect same thing with the atmosphere we breathe mm -hmm. so the water we drink the air we breathe uh, the land we use and obviously the biodiversity that we're a part of uh, in future generations these are the elements that uh, big polluters offset their costs uh, they mm -hmm. they end up um, uh, Oh, geez, I'm almost forgetting my words right now. They I'm end up with my don't worry. They end up um, uh, offsetting their costs. You know, they're trying to get rid of costs, focusing on where the this uh, concentrate their benefits. And then they just offset their costs, usually in the poorest, weakest politically uh, communities there are. And that's usually in, in, the, in these cases, uh, economically disparaged communities of color. So that's where they tend to offset their costs. So. Wow. All right. So now, uh, obviously, <clears throat> what else is going on is that there's been still ongoing disasters. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. Now, um, for our viewing audience, um, this is the most recent. The video I'll be playing is the most recent one. Um, can you just explain uh, or better yet, I'm going to play it. And then sure. I want you to explain to our viewing audience um, the overall danger of what we're witnessing here firsthand. Well, let's see here. I can't, are you playing it right now? It's, ah, there you go. So this is this was occurring early Sunday morning at around mm -hmm. eight eight thirty. Uh, these are flares at BP. Uh, they have multiple flares uh, at the facility. Now, what mm -hmm. people don't quite understand is when the flare is is in, uh, engorged as a flame, massive flame, uh, that indicates there's a malfunction at the facility. And so what was occurring at BP most of the day on Sunday was this constant uh, flaring off of uh, what they had, in this case, hydrogen sulfide. Now, to understand where that's coming from, uh, that's coming from northern Alberta. It's called uh, heavy sour crude that they're digging up. In fact, they are digging out the, the ancient boreal forest the basic mm -hmm. lungs of the planet. And it's the largest deforestation project. So they're tearing that forest down, they're digging out the soils and they're uh, slurring it with bitumen uh, and it's called diluted bitumen and with benzene and they're piping it down to BP. And what they have to do here is separate out the, uh, the sulfur from the, from the product. And so what ended up happening, they had a, a fire in the facility Mm -hmm. uh, a malfunction. They blamed it on the weather. Uh, <laughs> <don't really> know. <laughs> we haven't had such chronic uh, extreme weather lately, but they blamed it on the weather. And uh, so what they ended up doing, there's only two ways of dealing with it, pumping it out into Lake Michigan or flaring it up. Because what happens is uh, pressure builds up and they need to get it out quickly. Mm -hmm. And so they were releasing hydrogen uh, sulfide into the atmosphere, which was... Uh, people were able to breathe three counties away, 60 miles away, even in Michigan, far into Michigan, uh, because of the easterly, northeasterly winds. It luckily saved mo uh, people from Chicago because, you know, what happens in Chicago is so close. If it was going north or the wind was going north or westerly, Chicago would have been uh, uh, bombarded by this. Uh, so huh. that's that's what, what we faced uh, here. So people were in were uh, describing uh, getting physically th uh, sick, throwing up, uh, having headaches. I had headaches for two days um, and things like that. This is, unfortunately for East Chicagoans, this smell is very common, uh, but this is not something that usually gets released more broadly as, as this uh, episode indicated. Now, uh, when I was, uh, when we first met, this was like late 2016. We did a um, earlier version of this toxic tour. And um, I could say firsthand smelling some of the fumes there really threw me off. I remember um, not able to get the taste out of my mouth for like 
I think two days or so because it was just that god awful. I mean, I, I don't know how else to describe the chemical smell, and I wish that on nobody. But how many accidents have taken place at this BP refinery? And not to mention, where oh. are the regulators? Okay, so first part, how many accidents have right. taken place here? And then number two, where are the quote unquote regulators? Now, again, All right. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's, there's a whole bigger story about why BP is able to get away with this. And as I said before, folks, Indiana has a very laissez faire approach towards. Uh, big industry so first and foremost again let's start on how many accidents have happened at this bp refinery all right um so to know that you have it's it's kind of like a trade secret bp but people aren't quite aware and especially in a in a state like indiana bp self-regulates uh but if you're according to workers some whistleblowers uh, they have about two or three malfunctions a day in the facilities uh, so there, this is not an uncommon thing. When they first went online, they had some major uh, releases. First in 2014, a month after they went online with the brand new refinery in discharging massive amounts of oil into Lake Michigan. Um, also, they had several uh, leaks around here. If you know uh, this area, you know that our aquifer, it's called the Calumet Aquifer, has been condemned because BP is responsible for uh, uh, dumping or discharging or releasing over 16.8 million gallons of oil uh, onto our aquifer. So to this day, we still have 16.8 million gallons floating on our aquifer. And if you understand the hydrology of our system, it constantly circulates up to about eight miles out uh, from Lake wow. Michigan into Lake Michigan. So they are taking a passive uh, approach to us. IDEM, Indiana Department of Environment and Management, has never fined them, never cited them, and there has never been a uh, emergency action to clean this up. It is a large plume. The uh, U.S. Geological Survey has uh, done a few studies indicating where that plume is on industrial lands, but they it's funny, you can see the plumes going out into the neighborhoods, into the into the city parks, and then the study stops because they don't want to indicate that the plume is under uh, under the parks and various in schools and various places where people live. We do know in 2000 or in sorry 1992, uh, the oil started bubbling up into the basements of residents that lived on the uh, on the border of BP. Wait, so, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So yes. uh, there's, 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 there's a whole qu a bunch of questions I have to ask again, because because uh, again, folks, if, if you've been following Hardlands Media from the beginning, we, we've talked about the industrial pollution that's happening in uh, Lake Michigan uh, in the state of Indiana. How did BP get the power to self-regulate? It's sort of like telling a criminal, OK, you're in charge of the bank. Don't you take any money, even though this this guy works for the outfit and probably most likely has to uh, give give money to the bosses or whatever. I mean, how how, how does that happen? How, how does a corporation get to that point? And I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be very frightening and depressing. It's not just them. It's the entire um, industrial base here. They are allowed to report out uh, their uh, discharges and it's up to the public to call them on those numbers and things and say, hey, wait a minute, that didn't occur. I noticed this. And then to get IDEM to come up here. There used to be, uh, for the first 20 years of IDEM, there used to be a major um, uh, satellite facility of IDEM here in Northwest Indiana. But once, uh, about a year before BP went online with their new refinery, IDEM left the region entirely. So they don't have any offices in Northwest India, even though this is the most industrial region in the U.S. and perhaps on the continent. Uh, so give, give you an understanding of how industrial this is. And this is these are issues, not just discharging into Lake Michigan, where Chicago gets its drinking water, but discharging into the atmosphere. Uh, so there are 3,143 counties in the U.S. Lake County, where BP and um, U.S. Steel and Cleveland Cliffs are located, and they're located in East Chicago and in Gary, for the most part, concentrated in communities of color. Uh, Lake County generally ranks in the top five for industrial leases into the atmosphere. 
We don't rank 1,500 in the middle. We rank in the top five. And those industrial leases usually go northeast. The northeasterlies take them out over Lake Michigan. And quite often, they get then blown back into, into Chicago. Unfortunately, in this incident, which would have been a good thing if it had the BP release of the hydrogen uh, sulfide had blown back into, into Chicago, we probably would see some very pol some uh, political responses to this. Unfortunately, in Northwest Indiana and in Indiana, we our political figures are, are um, kind of cooed by industry. Industry runs this. BP is the big hegemon in Northwest Indiana. They run all economic development. You don't run up against them here. Mm -hmm. So wow. those are the kinds of things that we face in when it comes to regulation. In, in Indiana, unlike in Illinois, IDEM, Indiana Department of Environmental Management, is an arm of economic development. They are a broker for industries to get their what they want into the ground. That's what we face here. So, so, it, so in other words, <clears throat> if something needs to be done, it's up to the public, but then the public uh, are facing a huge monolith of a monster because, number one, uh, the corporation, uh, the corporations, not just only BP, but all the industrial facilities have all the politicians in their back pocket. And those that are supposed to regulate them are arms of the economy. So uh, that is just um, it's, if, if that doesn't tell you that uh, we live in a sick rig neoliberal system, I, I, I don't know what uh, other kind of proof that you'll need. Go. I don't mean to cut you off. Go continue. No, you're, you're, the, it even goes further. The fear of these industries go. They're a huge uh, power base. So if you're a whistleblower like I was back in uh, 2007 when they were going through their permitting process, uh, they'll make an example of you. I was immediately fired from my government positions and all wow. the boards that I were, was on. Uh, and those are the kinds of they can make it make you a model for for what they you know, for other people's behavior. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that that occur here. Uh, so nobody wants to go against them. One of the things to recognize also, this was a steel region. Also, the Southeast Chicago is a steel region. Mm -hmm. And they're fighting, they, you know, Chicago has a different economy. You are an information economy. Uh, you deindustrialized uh, in the 1980s. You shut down your steel mills. You moved a lot of your chemical companies out. Now the Southeast side is trying to find, trying to repurpose those lands. And unfortunately, they went into landfills. And, and that became a, a threat to the to the environment down there. So what Chicago did and what Cook County did is they put a moratorium on landfills, 25 year moratorium. Unfortunately, they, Chicago didn't stop making waste. And so they are just constantly trying to find out where to place it. Well, where they end up placing a lot of their waste and where they end up placing their industries that they torn down is in Northwest Indiana in communities of color, East Chicago and Gary. Gary is constantly fighting landfills and, and waste to energy projects. They love to, to describe these projects as green projects, but they are noxious. The fumes off of them in the local community is horrible. And so what we get is a huge concentration of these projects and they sell them to markets like Chicago as green projects. You know, these are really good. Uh, I look at us in Northwest Indiana as a industrial colony of Chicago and also a little bit of Indianapolis. We throw a lot of money down there and we service the Chicago market. So the things you don't want in your, in your districts, political districts get pushed out to Northwest Indiana. But it does come back to us because again, uh, let's face yes. it, uh, Chicago is connected to Lake Michigan. <laughs> I well, mean, we are the city on the lake. So those chemicals that are being polluted are being put into uh, Lake Michigan do get into our drinking water. So it's not only lead that we have to worry about. We have to worry about other dangerous chemicals and heavy metals. Um, and, and the thing is, and I, I hate, I I'm, I'm going to hate saying this. And again, this is just, this is just a little small caveat. Just everyone else, leave it alone. But it's just, when you have one example, even Rahm Emanuel trying to sue us steel. And again, nothing really came of it because the, the lake is still being polluted. You know, it, it it shows a lack of concern by Chicago politicians and politicians in general that uh, have their cities or communities by Lake Michigan, because these chemicals, these heavy metals have long lasting effects on the human body. Am, am, am I wrong there? Or because the thing is, there's 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 a lot of cover up 
and people not wanting to talk about the real danger that's impacting countless lives here in the Midwest. I, I completely agree. And also, I think bringing up Rob Emanuel and the neoliberal project is a really uh, important thing. However, I wanted to just a, a caveat to that is, a little bit is that there are, even though Rahm Emanuel may have brought a suit against U.S. Steel for uh, discharging things, it did have a slight effect. Um, the good thing about that is prior to there are all these little marginal uh, uh, positive steps while there are these grand steps going the wrong direction at least under the obama administration they allowed political entities outside of districts uh if if you're being if you're being harmed by something outside your district you can sue prior to obama that wasn't the case we all know that the air we breathe you know doesn't know borders the the waters uh rivers go across uh political boundaries uh, mm -hmm. Prior to Obama, you couldn't sue due to what was going down. So we couldn't get any political entities in Northwest Indiana to go in, and sue uh, or even go after U.S. Steel when they were, you know, discharging chromium six into Lake Michigan. We, I went to save the dunes. I went to all these other environmental groups, the Sierra Club. Nobody wanted to even bring up their voice. It wasn't until another big power like Chicago came in. Mm -hmm. And they gave voice. Now, Save the Dunes is signing on to that. You know, wow. Sierra Club is signing on to that. Uh, the the mayor of Portage, where this occurred, is signing on to that. So those are some positive things. So one, let's just back up into BP in this situation, with not just the hydrogen sulfide that was released, but what they're doing as a project. Uh, we, we, in the last couple of days, have been suffering from the uh, forest fires uh, the particulate that's coming yeah. down. Here. And I, I was, I was surprised by that too. I know that, uh, it, it even came all the way down to the South side of Chicago. And when it looks like, uh, something uh, like a scene from the fog, um, you know, I, I, I gotta wonder like, ho Holy cow. It's, it's, it's really that bad up there. Shout out yeah. to our Canadian audience. I hope you guys are safe. It is, it is going all the way down to Indianapolis and much further. So the effects of this forest fire is, the size of a continent. It's having great effects, thousands of miles. What we don't realize is how even just a simple project, what AP is doing, is contributing to that very thing that we're suffering from. There's a lot of memes uh, blaming Canada, but we have BP here, which is tearing up the boreal forest, the largest deforestation project. They're tearing out the soil, like the, the, the sands. They're boiling it uh, over in Northern Alberta. And they're creating these tailing ponds as large as Lake Ontario. That's that's waste. And then they're piping it down to BP to be refined. And then we're burning it into in our vehicles all over the place. What we don't realize is that single project, the, the tar sands in, in, in um, northern Alberta, that project area is the size of Florida. And it has a not just a global effect it has it is affecting us on the continent on the base on the on the scale of our continent today in the last couple of days we are suffering from some of the cause or some of its consequences that that the tar sands is contributing to we know that the tar sands is the dirtiest form of energy and yet we're going at it on such a massive scale and we're affecting an entire continent and so when the uh when global when the when the climate is changing in in the uh, in the Arctic and the uh, permafrost is melting and the forests are burning in northern Alberta and also in Ontario and various places across the area in the ancient boreal forest, which is the lungs of the planet, we know we are causing huge huge effects and these are really really bad. These are not things that that you could remember as a child that was happening. These are new uh, occurrences, new events that never happened before because we have passed some thresholds that we can't get back on. And this is where, what, the, what we're having to experience. It's gonna become more normal, unfortunately. And as those forests burn, it's, they're, not, they're not gonna be producing oxygen for the planet mm -hmm. as they used to. These are problematics, serious issues.
now I, I do want to bring up BP. And again, again, these are serious issues because <clears throat> there is no planet B. We cannot go to planet A, B, C, or D. I mean, we are stuck here on this rock called Earth and uh, we're not going anywhere. But, you know, <clears throat> what, what I have noticed, though, and this is something I want to bring up from our last documentary that we did uh, with you, and that is the lack of engagement or either that people really trying to raise their voices out because after 2020, you know, there was a decline or perhaps dare I say not decline, but the end of, well, people trying to protest or challenge the system or raise the rocket. seems like everybody went to brunch. Now that we're entering into this election cycle, I mean, is there now the slow re-engagement of people wanting to call out BP or, are people who once disappeared for four years now coming back again? Because that's that that was like a, a something that really uh, stayed with me the last time we, we were there in October. And that was all these groups that we covered during the Trump administration just disappeared. And BP still polluting. They're still having right. accidents. And, 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 to, uh, and again, uh, everyone should check out our two documentaries that we did, Toxic Tour 1 and Toxic Tour 2. It's it the accidents keep happening over and over again, and people are still dying from these right. harmful chemicals and pollutants. Well, um, it's all true, uh, especially here in Northwest Indiana. We were able to sustain a pretty strong movement uh, for several years, uh, and unfortunately, when COVID hit, it it knocked out a lot of our own movement in Northwest India. We actually had a lot of people in the movement that passed away from long-term chronic illnesses that they've been suffering. Uh, we also had a problem when uh, we had been negotiating with the Trump administration for three years with Scott Pruitt in cleaning up the USS-led Superfund site. This is a site that was built where a housing project was built on top of a lead refinery without any cleanup. Interesting enough, BP was a responsible party in that. They had an ownership in that land and then in the uh, lead refinery. But what ended up happening is we, the residents here really got active. It was a real uh, positive moment uh, for people in Northwest Indiana. It sprung up lots of activities everywhere, which I was really encouraged of. But, but unfortunately, when COVID happened, uh, Trump switched uh, EPA administrators from Scott Pruitt. I forget the name of the new administrator that came in, but his first action was an executive order to stop uh, moving forward on the cleanup of the USS lead project. We had been wanting it to be cleaned up to residential levels. We had negotiated with the administration for three years to kind of get to get that going. We're at the last stages for approval for monies and stuff. And an executive order from the Trump administration completely reversed it. What we've seen under Biden is that, oh, let's, this is an opportunity to put an Amazon warehouse over it or something like that. Uh, that hasn't occurred either. Um, so they're trying to reindustrialize instead of clean up. And that becomes a problem because, again, as I tell you about the hydrology, this stuff is really toxic. It is moving eight feet a year and could get it can eventually move into Lake Michigan, which it probably has already, and to uh, neighboring communities. Now, let me give you a positive, though. You, what you, this is the story of Northwest Indiana. And we've, it, it, the, uh, the environmental movement has fragmented enormously with the big NGOs and the cancel mm -hmm. culture. Uh, but what we see going on in Chicago is a huge positive uh, a movement. You're doing lots of good things. What the Southeast Environmental Task Force is doing on mm -hmm. the Southeast side and the community that is building up around it to, uh, to say, we don't want big polluters coming into this area. We no longer, we have got all this fallow brown fields. We need to repurpose it. And instead of cleaning up in, you know, corporate leaders and uh, government interests say, let's just put another uh, industrial property on there. The residents down there are saying no. They don't mind some industry because they're working class. They want industry to work in, but they want clean industry. They want also uh, amenities that they have in other parts of the city that they don't have down there. They're on a fantastic river, the Calumet River. They want to be able to take advantage of that. They don't want it to be polluted. They don't want to put another CDF, confined disposal facility, on that river or on the lakefront that 
that uh, is harmful to the community. There are many, many things that they're fighting down there and environmental justice is something that has, uh, has a hold on Chicago, which is a really positive step. We here in Indiana, we don't have an environmental justice framework at all that the state even uh, considers. So there, there's a lot of good things going on in Chicago. Uh, as much as I can, wishing that our, our fumes and everything waff over the Chicago border so you guys can sue us is, <laughs> I can't have that happen all the time. Uh, but you got, but you have all been doing, you know, some diligent work. Uh, well, there's some positive things there. So l l let me just say this. Look, what's happening to the people in Indiana, especially with these industrial facilities is wrong. And look, Chicago is a major metropolitan city. And so if those fumes were ever to fly over our humble little town, um, I'm pretty sure a majority of the city would get upset, uh, and want something done about it immediately. Um, now the thing is, I don't see that happening, unfortunately, unless weather patterns change and we, we do get the smell of the toxic fumes, but we do have, uh, the fact that there is again, heavy material and, uh, chemicals, metals, and other kind of poisons that are being put into Lake Michigan. So to my viewing audience in Chicago, or perhaps those in Wisconsin or Michigan, Thomas, where can people go to help you guys out there and maybe rebuild a movement in Indiana? so that none of us are polluted anymore. Because I'm going to speak this just, just from my own personal point of view. When I first did the Toxic Tour, when I first met you way back in 2016, then did that documentary in 2018, did that follow-up in 2022, I've been consistent about this. Yeah, I yeah. haven't set foot back into Lake Michigan. <laughs> I won't swim in that goddamn water after finding out what's in there. And especially uh. hearing what happened to the Chicago surfers and some of their skin and health problems that happened to them. It is a very real thing. So where can people go to help you guys out? If the Because this is a serious issue. Folks, if you live in Chicago and if you swam in Lake Michigan, you are swimming in those chemicals that it's coming from BP and the other industrial facilities. It's not just BP, folks. Take it away, Thomas. All right, so what I would recommend in Northwest India, like I said, uh, a lot of the environmental movement is extraordinarily fragmented. Industries, it's very easy for them to throw a few bucks uh, to give voice to people, to fragment uh, any sort of movement. Uh, whether And they often use NGOs like the Beyond Coal campaign or uh, Just Transition. Unfortunately, it's true. They're also using a lot of the white community on the southern part of the county uh, to uh, give voice. And they're fragmenting the movements by, unfortunately, uh, by not giving strength and voice of the community that actually lives here, like in East Chicago and Gary. Um, they usually, when it comes to an environmental uh, issue, it's the LBGQ community that's unfortunately taking over uh, that voice on the southern part of the county and uh, utilizing cancel culture to start canceling as many people as they can. Um, you understand that in traditional communities like East Chicago and Gary, um, and with churches, the importance of churches in these communities, um, a lot of the environmentalists in the southern part of the white, let's call them the white princesses of the environmental movement are not very, um, they'd like to tell uh, uh, the people that are actually suffering it what they're supposed to do, how you're supposed to do this. Uh, and stuff like that. It becomes a huge problem. So I uh, we're, we have uh, the community strategy group in uh, East Chicago that deals with environmental justice. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, but more importantly, your voice in Chicago. You have the Abrams Center at the University of Chicago with Mark Templeton. Mm -hmm. It is with the Abrams Center that uh, we are able to get uh, a kickstart on a lot of things. It's the Abrams Center that helped us with the USS-led Superfund site. It was the Abrams Center that I, I gave them, Mark Templeton, a toxic tour about in 2015, and then we've started seeing a domino effect of some things that are happening. Uh, the Abrams Center is one that's backing the, uh, the surfers. Uh, again, you get, why are surfers from Chicago uh, mm -hmm. suing or organizing? Because the people in Northwest Indiana, there's so much fragmentation. So the Abrams Center is one thing. And then there's the Southeast Environmental Task Force. Uh, uh, there's also um, uh, Piro in Pilsen and, and, and um, 
let me see, I can't quite think of another right now, but those are the places I would be contacting. Mm -hmm. um, we are connected with the Southeast Environmental Task Force. I used to be a board member there for four or five years. Um, some really positive things are going on there uh, as well. So there's, uh, th you know, Community Strategy Group, Southeast Environmental Task Force, the Abrams Center, and mm -hmm. Piero and Pilsen. What I would like uh, for you, Thomas, is to uh, send me a list of some of these groups, because what I'm going to do for this interview is clip it uh, and post the links so that people who live in the Chicagoland area or Wisconsin or in Michigan or even in Indiana, uh, where they can go. And also what's in that comment section, I'll pin it to this uh, YouTube clip uh, that I'll do for this interview is give our two links to our two uh, documentaries, the Toxic Tour, one that took place in 2018, the other one that took place in 2022, so that people can be informed more about what's happening there and how things have gotten progressively worse, but maybe there's a uh, talk of perhaps an improvement or maybe, yeah. dare I say it, some accountability, some justice. And obviously, since there's an election cycle, um, perhaps there will be more of a spotlight and more of an engagement in here. Um, but besides all that, uh, Thomas, uh, is there any uh, – I know that there was another issue you wanted to bring up, uh, I think, in regards towards BP oh. and some of its chemical pollutants. So I, I want you to t take it away before we end this segment. Well, let me just make one more statement. Right now, we're, we're coming out of the – uh, the blanket of smoke that's it's starting to clear up. And, Thankfully, thank God. Yeah, right. And that's, and I want to let everybody please don't forget what that experience was like because prior to that, a community like East Chicago and Gary live under that kind of a blanket all the time. We have Cleveland Cliffs. I have, if you, you can find a post on my Facebook, uh, right before the smokes came down, I had one day all this you know, steel shavings cover my pool, my, my, uh, my car. Uh, this is a common thing. They just discharge metals, all that they call it kish, metals all the time into the atmosphere. And we live under that. It's far worse than what we just experienced these last three days here in Chicago and elsewhere. Uh, this is a common thing in a community like East Chicago and Gary. Mm -hmm. And that's due to Cleveland Cliffs and US Steel. Um, we can't let any of these industries off the hook. Fantastic. And I, I think definitely we need to have some accountability. So um, I will definitely be reaching out to you because I want those links so that people can know where to go and how they can help contribute. And there I say, and maybe we could finally end the pollution that's happening in Lake Michigan. It should happen the day before yesterday, but might as well start now. So as always, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's keep in contact. And uh, for folks, again, if you want to see just the overall pollution and disaster check out our two documentaries toxic tour and toxic tour 2 uh but with that being said we'll be continuing on with the rest of our main show thomas take care and have a wonderful weekend thank you for the opportunity thanks absolutely all the best to you I guess this isn't such an awful place Is that what you want me to say? You prove it's possible to sleep for days And to still think you're right here awake The cost of living isn't much to make But God, it's so hard to say And when they told you everything was safe Will you save? Mm. Will you save? Will you save? Mm. Will you save? This isn't such an awful place Is that what you want me to say? You prove it's possible to sleep for days And I still think you're right here away The cost of living isn't much to make But God, it's so hard to say And when they told you everything was 
cancerous growth who has come here to vie for your vote come here to cry at the camps and to mourn at the shore for the bodies that float by the wreck of an immigrant boat then it's back to their luxury home couple security booths and a moat couple cigars little escargot little booze and a soak just breathe in the steam and the smoke pink salt lavender candles are low shit when you do what you do gotta lighten the load and he got a life of his own that's a sight to behold and it's a lot to control to decipher the code or to siphon the soul. The cost of a good night's sleep for the working elite is a bargain no matter the toll. Mm. Worth any wager and that comes straight from the mouth of a means to the goal that will swallow us whole. Right for the picking if you don't mind mold and you know I don't. Maybe we're pleasantly prone. Maybe we're taking a licking compliantly ticking and ticking and ticking but never explode. No, I don't deliver the prettiest image, but damn if it isn't an accurate vision of natural vision of rage at the system and abject heartbreak patiently waiting for any who will listen. That little blue bird who was watching your words is a federal carrier pigeon, a Langley first. It's a patient observer who hears what it wants and is trained for the worst. Oh, you got nothing to hide. They'll be the ones to decide that after they root through your purse, after they read all your text, after they raid your apartment, confiscate all of its contents, then conjure up evidence out of the air on a wing and a prayer and malicious intelligence nonsense. Any presumption of innocence long since gone, right along with your comforts and constants. Historically first they will come from the communists. <laughs> so why in the fuck would I say I'm a communist? Well it might be I love my community more than the monsters of opulence who are holding us hostage, who are vomiting promises. Might be I'm all done seeing our pensions and benefits harvested. Might be I'm all done watching the populace being disarmed in the guise of an armistice. Watching a woman collapse on the floor who will rise no more. She is wheeled out the door and you're next in line for the pharmacist. If you can get me to vote, it's a hard no confidence. But part of the charm and deception is politics wearing the mask of incompetence. It's all in the art of austerity, darling. It's all in the slide of the providence. Until home is as wide as your cubicle height and is only as deep as your coffin is. Maybe I'm miles away from impatience, aching to break off the head of the snake where the capital lost reptile brain and the margin of profit is. Like off with his. Like off with his. I guess this isn't such an awful place Is that what you want me to say? You prove it's possible to sleep for days And to still think you're right here awake The cost of living isn't much to make But God, it's so hard to say And when they told you everything was safe Will you save? 